Well, I said y'all pray. Give us some more. If you have your Bibles, we'll be reading in Colossians chapter 1. I have several different places I want to touch on. And here's where we'll be starting. And getting our main thought, Lord willing. But Colossians chapter 1, we're going to start I believe with verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not removed or be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. I think that's all we're going to read there. I thought we'd read a little more, but I think that's all we're going to read there. As I said, y'all pray. Bless you, Lord. And I think about this. It said there, if you continue in the faith, grounded and set. And this thought come to me last night, and I thought about it. I sat over there a few minutes ago, and I thought and prayed and wondered if it was what I needed to, to preach. But think about where it said, in the faith, grounded and settled. Now there's different places in the Bibles, in the Bible, I don't know why I said Bibles, that handles this using different terms, if you will. In John chapter 15, so the first verse, it said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And it talked in another place about being the wild from the wild vine and being grafted into the true vine. Of course, that was Jesus Christ speaking there in John. So we see that we came out of the, the wild vine, if you will, out of sin, and we're grafted into the true vine. And you know, I'll pray I'll get started in here in a minute. I'm trying to remember which bookmark marks what. Over in Revelations 22, one verse here, Verse 16, and this is the words of Jesus, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. You know, he said, I am the root of David. You know, every tree, every plant has a root. That's where it gathers its nutrients from. You know, the root spreads through the ground. They say that a tree, every bit that's above ground, is matched underground in roots. So you figure if you've got a tree 50 foot tall and 30 foot across, you've got roots 50 foot deep and 30 foot across. And every limb above ground has its own root underground. If that root cut is cut, that limb will die. So we see that it starts from the bottom there. And Jesus said, I am the root. You know, He was the start. And it said that we're grafted into it. And you know, I, I was thinking about this, and I don't know kind of what the Lord, had, I guess, had used to get my mind started on it was these cut flowers here. 
you know, you take these flowers and you cut them off the root. You stick them in that water and they'll stay pretty for a few days before they start to fade, but they're, from the time they're cut off the root, they're dying. And that water will, will mimic the life and extend it a little bit longer, but if it's not in that water, it'll die within a day or two. But you might extend it a few more days, but that water will only extend it so long. You know, it said also over there in Revelations, also in chapter 22, verse 1, he said, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God, throne of God and of the Lamb. I may have to turn that fan off. And it said over in Luke chapter, or no, John chapter 4. I ain't going to read the whole story. We know it. It's where the woman of Samaria came to the well. Jesus was sitting there. And it said in verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into an everlasting life. You know, you can take... And I thought about there at the house, we have a well. And I despise it with a passion. Nasty water. Our neighbor has a nice spring up behind us. Once in a while we'll go out because there's a a fountain over in the field, we'll go out and fill a jug or two and put it in the fridge, that good spring water. But you know, I thought about that. You know, here the woman came to the well for water. And he said, Whoso drinketh of this well will thirst again. But there in Revelations, it spoke of the water springing up, the well of water springing up unto everlasting life. You know, you take a well, and a man has drilled down until they hit the water. They drilled 400 foot with ours and hit a half a gallon a minute. which is very little. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's nasty. It's not natural. The water's down there, but it don't come to the surface there. So the side effects is the sediment and the dirt and, you know, the stuff in it that, that makes it taste bad. But you take that spring of water, pure, you know, when somebody's finding a spring, they travel up a branch or a wet spot until it comes out of the rock. They find where it comes directly out of the rock and then they build a little bowl around it. That's their spring. And it's usually really good water. Really cold. Tastes good. So you see, you could take a cup of water out of that well and a cup of water out of that spring and you could set it here. To look at it, you wouldn't know the difference. You wouldn't know which was which. But one's going to taste a whole lot better than the other. Amen. Now you can take any cut flowers, you can put them in that vase of water. That water will simulate life. They'll absorb a little bit of it to allow them to live a few more days. But it's not the water that the root provides. It's not the nutrients. It can't last. Now granted, the blooms would eventually die on the, the vine too. But at the end of their life. You know, if we're rooted in Jesus, we'll live. Now sooner or later, if Christ don't come back, and this, this body's going to die. If Christ comes back, this body's still going to die. Because the Bible says when we meet Him in the air, our body will be changed. This body will pass away and we'll be given a new immortal body. But if we're grounded in Jesus, we will endure. And we'll receive eternal life. If the flower is left on the, the root, when it reaches the end of its life, it'll produce seed, which will continue life. Which is what we do. It said that by, it said in one place, by the fruit it bears, you'll know the tree. You know, whether it be good or evil. But you know, these flowers will wither. Will wilt because that's just a simulation of it. There's a lot of doctrine out there that simulates life. Sounds good. Feels good. You know, people go, oh, I got such a blessing out of that service. 
Oh, the Lord really worked. Oh, there's so much power in that man. But there's no power. They'll go and they'll praise a, a man of God and they'll talk about how good he is for month after month after month. And then suddenly he'll say something he, they don't like. Nah, that man ain't got God. Well, what's wrong? <laughs> what changed? You know, if we get in a true church, it will continue to bless. We will continue to grow. We will continue to flourish. If we've got the true doctrine, we will continue to grow. But if you get where it's not the truth, it only has a semblance of life. The Bible said, and I wish I had looked that one up, see if I can get it out right, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That's right. A form of godliness. <coughs> Anybody can claim to have a god. I mean, you look at Greek mythology, they had hundreds of gods. Hundreds and hundreds of them. They had their main gods, didn't they have lesser gods that trickled down? Dozens and dozens and dozens of them. They had a god for everything. You know, but that didn't make their gods real. They had a form of godliness because they believed in them and worshipped them. But could their God hear them? No. When Elijah went up against the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove there, and he convinced them to offer sacrifices and the God that, act, that answered with fire, he would be the God of Israel. And they liked that. They began to build up their altar and they cut up their bullock and put it on there. And they began to pray. And I think that was sometime in the morning when they started praying. <clears throat> and they prayed. And they prayed. And they prayed some more. And Elijah began to mock them. He said, maybe your, your God's on a journey and can't hear you. Pray a little louder. Maybe He's asleep. Shout a little louder. And they began to, to panic. So they began to jump up on the altar and cut themselves. And bleed upon the altar as the manner of their worship was. Still no answer. They done that all day long till the night time of the evening sacrifice. And then it was Elijah's turn. You know, I can almost see him. Move over, boys. And he built him an altar out of rough stone. If you notice he didn't use the same one. That one was profane. That one wasn't fit. So he built him an altar there out of rough stone cut the bullock up and laid, laid it on the altar in order. Then he dug a trench around it and he said, bring me some water. So they brought four barrels of water and they poured over the sacrifice. He said, bring me four more. Now this was in the time of great drought. Things were dry. Best we can understand, if, if we understand correctly, this was probably salt water. And salt won't burn or nothing. It'll put a fire out. So not only were they putting water, but probably salt water on the sacrifice. I think they poured about 12 barrels of water on there. How big the barrel was, I don't know. That's a lot of water. It filled the trench all the way around and the sacrifice and everything was fully wet. And then Elijah began to pray. He said, he said his prayer. I can't remember exactly what he said. He said, basically, he said, Lord, show them, show them your God. And fire fell from heaven. Consumed the sacrifice. Consumed the stone that was upon The dust of the earth and the water in the trenches. Consumed it all. And it didn't take Elijah half a day of praying to get it done. Because he knew the truth. He had the truth. <clears throat> they had a form of godliness. They had altars and temples and groves built all over to go worship. And they may have been the most faithful of worshipers there was. That didn't make their God real. That's right. The servants of Malik offered their children in the fire. Mm -hmm. Threw their children in the fire under their God, but that didn't make Malik real. He didn't answer their prayers. He couldn't. Because he didn't exist. But when the children of Israel prayed, God answered. Because he had power. They were rooted in the truth. They were growing. They were built on the rock. You know, over in Deuteronomy, and this is Old Testament, foretelling of Christ in Deuteronomy 32. 
Verse 3, he said, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. The New Testament said Jesus was the rock. You know, the cornerstone, the root of David. But upon that, we are built. We're grafted in. If we have that salvation, we have hope. If we have that godliness, we have hope. But if we're cut off and just stuck down in a tub of water, what hope do we have? We're going to weather or die. They can pour water at us all they want. It won't work. Mm -hmm. You can dig up a bush. If you're careful and you get about all the root ball, you can transplant it somewhere and it might just live. If you water it good, but if you cut too much of the root off when you dig it up, you can pour a thousand gallons of water on it, it's still going to die. Because without the root, it cannot live. But it withers and dies. You know, he said, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give shall never thirst, but, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto eternal life, or unto, unto everlasting life. So we see <clears throat> power comes from God. That's right, amen. We see that we must be grafted in. And we must be in that true godliness. Not a semblance thereof. Not a, a vain mockery of it. Not a just a feel-good emotion. You know, the worship of God is not always happy. Everybody wants to go to church and, you know, have a hallelujah. Oh, that felt good service. You know, clap your hands and, and pray, raise your hands and praise God's service. Not all worshiping God is happy, happy go lucky. Shouldn't be. We've got no right to expect that when our families and our friends and the people down the road are dying and going to hell. Why should we think that we should be blessed? Why should the churches think that they deserve blessings when they ain't doing nothing to save the lost? They're sitting, as the old saying is, they're sitting on the laurels, doing nothing. We could all do more. I could do more. But the blessings won't come until we serve God. Serving God means more than going to church on Sunday morning and, and warming a pew. Right, a lot of people says, well, I, I, I warm the pew. That's my job. I, I'm there on Sunday. That's all God wants me to do. God never called anybody to just go sit in church. Everybody has a job. Yeah. Whether it's preaching, teaching, singing, testifying, witnessing, you know, whatever it is, everybody has a job to do. And we better be doing it if we want to bless them. Now, we can make up our own lessons. We can pretend. We can get to, to singing and, and bring up our own happiness and feel good. Imagine it. You know, it seems like a lot of churches has the best imaginations of anybody in the world. Better than any child that's ever lived because they have the best services and they have a bit of spirit there. And I'm not judging. I've been in them and found it. There have been many times, I, or a lot of times, I've been at church and Everybody was a hooping and a hollering and saying, oh, I, that was a good service. The Spirit really moved. And I was there. Did I do something wrong? What's wrong with me, Lord? And, I mean, I'm sure you've been through it too. The Lord just almost speak to you and say, it ain't you. <laughs> you didn't do nothing. You know, it's fake. It's a lie. They think in the honesty of their heart that God's blessing them. But it's emotion. It's caught up in the moment. That's right. It's that water from the whale that'll quench your thirst for a little while, but sooner or later you're going to thirst again. Mm -hmm. If the only time you feel good about your salvation is when you're sitting on the church bench, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. If it don't go with you and follow you home, Something's wrong. Amen. If as the brother mentioned, 
and when he preached earlier, if when you get out in the parking lot you're cussing like a sailor, something's wrong. You know, people are confused. Most of them in the honesty in their heart. They don't know no different. They think that's what it's supposed to be. But we should be worshiping God and feeling God every moment of our life. Mm -hmm. Feeling condemnation when we do something wrong. Yeah. Feeling the warning when we think about doing something wrong. Yeah. Feeling the blessings when we do something right. That's right. Feeling His presence and His, His comforting arms when we're scared. You know, feeling hopeful when things are going good. God should be there every moment. Not just on Sunday morning. Not just during revivals. We should be happy. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. You know, excuse me, how many people are glad when they say, let's go to the house of the Lord? Most people, it's Sunday, let's go to church. Yes, we got to go. It's expected of us. I grew up, it was expected. You know, I never thought anything different. Growing up, I knew that wasn't an option, Sunday. You went to church. That's the way I was raised. That's the way every child should be raised. True. Right. Far too many parents ask their even their little kids, Do you want to go to church with us today? You know, or the kid says, I don't want to go to church. But, okay, you can stay home. Tell them they're going to church. Mm -hmm. The Bible said, Raise them up in the way they should go. And when they're grown, they will not easily depart from it. That's right. Excuse me. But. Are we doing that? Not just the physical children, but the spiritual young people of the church. Yeah. Are we raising them up right? Are we teaching them right from wrong? Are we grounding them in the truth? You know, Paul in one place said, and I won't get this quoted exactly right because I always misremember the exact wording of the Scripture. But he said something to the effect that when you have need, that I give you the the meteor parts of the subject, or when I ought to be teaching you the meteor part of the subject, ye have need of the meal. I was trying to look to see if I had wrote that scripture now. Let me see here. I think I found it here. I'm going to get that right. Anytime I find a scripture I like, a lot of times I'll write where it is down on a piece of paper for future reference. <laughs> Hebrews 5, verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Mm -hmm. When you should be teachers, instead you're still on the bottle. You know, when you should be out there telling people, what's right and what's wrong. I'm still having to tell you. You know, and that's where the church world is at. They are not growing. They haven't grown in years because they're happy letting somebody else do the work for them. You know. Another place, 1 Corinthians, he said, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet know ye, now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men. And can the collective church out there say, Ouch! Is that handsome? Bless you, Lord. Whereas there is among you envy, strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal? He said, Oh, we're, we're Christians. He said, Here, if you're fighting and fussing and bickering, you're carnal. Mm -hmm. Carnal means lost, it means worldly. Churches are fighting and feuding and whining. You know, I've said it before, I'll say it again, most churches are the biggest babies there is. Because they want their way, and if they don't get their way, they pout. You know, blame the preacher. You know, us preachers sure have a thankless job. You 
know, if you don't like the message, blame the one that sent it, not the messenger. Talk to God, not to me. <laughs> you know, people need to realize the truth. They need to be learning. We need to be learning more about God. But instead, we keep having to go over the basics with people because they don't want to listen. You still have to tell them, no, you can't live out in the world and still make it to heaven. No, you can't do that when they should already know it. Because they say, well, it's okay. It ain't so bad, but God said it's sin. But we're still on to debate. Churches are debating things that should have never been debated to begin with because the Bible said it plain. But instead of listening to God, they got to sit down in their committees and their study sessions and try and figure out what it means. Well, I know it says that, but it, it doesn't mean that. You know, God wasn't a liar and He wasn't a deceiver. He said what He means and mean, meant what He said. You know, if He said it was wrong, it was wrong. That's right, amen. If he said, do this, he meant do this. The children of Israel learned that lesson all too often. He told them, you go over the River Jordan. They said, we will not go. He said, fine, you won't go. I'll cause you to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and your children will go over. And then they were scared and they said, oh, 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 well, we'll go over. And he said, no, you won't. They said, yeah, we will. And they went over and they were wiped out. Only a remnant survived because God didn't bless them. But now when their children went over, along with Joshua, one other, I can't think of his name right now, that had obeyed, been willing to obey God at first, when they went over, they routed the enemy because they listened and God blessed. They thought they knew more than God did. You know, I, was, I can't remember which one. One of the brothers preached, I believe it was today, about when they wanted a king. It may have been Brother Larry and last night. I can't remember. You know, oh, we want a king to rule over us. You know, no, they didn't. Not if they'd had any sense. We wouldn't have had the problems we'd had over the years if man hadn't been ruling. If God had been in charge, things would have been a lot better. This world would be a lot better place. But they thought they knew better than God did. If God had warned them had king, he'd set Adam up as king. But he didn't. You know, if we would just listen, if we just get into the truth, root ourselves there, ground ourselves there, and stay there, we'd remain faithful and strong. But they don't. And churches lets the devil eat away at their foundation. You know, you take an old tree out here. This one over here is going to be that way one of these days. You know, you cut down beside it, you start digging the dirt out from under the roots. Little at a time, start removing that dirt out of the roots. Sooner or later, the tree's going to fall because there's nothing holding it. Sure. The building, water starts seeping under the foundation. You know, washes the foundation away or the dirt underneath, and then the foundation just collapses. Foundation's all well and strong as well as something solid's under it. Mm -hmm. Just like a piece of tile. A piece of tile's nice and hard. As long as there's a solid structure under it. You remove the underneath and it's so brittle it'll just snap right in your hands. Same with the church. As long as the church was grounded in the truth, held in the truth, the church flourished and grew. But then we began to backbite, gossip, fight, you. Let the devil come in and chew away at the foundations. Mm -hmm. Chew away at the roots. We were cut away. You know, Jesus said there in that one scripture we read, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Mm -hmm. You know, he said on down, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're grounded in this truth, we're safe. You know, but if we are not grounded in truth, we will not make it. That's right. If we ain't bearing forth good fruit, if we ain't living righteously, remaining faithful, you know, keeping the commandments, yeah. we won't make it in. You know, 
Brother Johnny touched so close to my thought earlier. I mean, he just he just went right along the edge of it. His message earlier, I thought I just I kind of laughed back there myself a lot when I heard he's hitting right down my road, right down my message, and I was getting right home. Here he goes down, which is good. <laughs> so that's good. It's a blessing when you can see multiple messages come and the Lord's working in both and they go along with one another. You know, it helps us feel that we, we were actually right in the first place because sometimes you wonder. Sometimes you question yourself, Lord, did you really want me to preach it? Mm -hmm. You know, but if we're grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, you know, well, you can't lose it. I say in church the other day, one of their um, church doctrines was that once you're saved, you're eternally saved. Well, this scripture denies that. Because he said, if you continue in the faith, grounded in seven, and be not moved away. How, if you can't be moved away, why does it say be not moved away? Mm -hmm. right. You know, the devil can't remove me from the rock. Man can't move me from the rock. So if I stand here, unless it's a really stout man, I can hold on this, and they ain't going to move me out from behind this. But I can step out from behind it if I want to. It's going to take a stout man to drag me off this unless he drags his pulpit and I don't. But I can step off. The devil can't take you out of God's hand. God won't cast you out of His hand. And man can't take it away from you. But you can give it up mm -hmm. if we don't remain grounded and settled. But if we continue in the faith, grounded, rooted, you know, we have to be grafted into the root of David. You know, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel was God's chosen people. You know, when Christ came, that all changed. That's not to say that Jews ain't going to make it in heaven. A lot of them will. A lot of them won't. But when Christ came, He offered it unto the Gentiles too. And it became the New Testament Scripture when it mentions, especially in Revelation stuff, when it mentions Israel, it's not talking the physical Jews. It's talking the church of God. We are Israel. They are Israel. If their acceptance of Christ is true. But that's who will make it in. Yeah. To know. They're not going to make it in any more than we are if they don't obey. You know, no matter how great you are, if you're not obedient to God, you will not make it in. It's but people are not rooted. The devil snuck in just like these blooms. The devil snuck in and snipped the stem. Mm -hmm. Stuck them in a vase of old dirty water. Made them think they're still grounded in the truth. Made them think they're still drinking out of that spring of living water. When all they're drinking out of is old muddy well water. You know, sometimes I, I really wonder. Our well water, you know, we have to change the filter once in a while in the house. It gets stopped up. But still, you make a pitcher of tea or something, and you get down to the, the last little glass of tea, and you pour it in your glass. Then you look at the bottom of the glass, and it's just full of black sediment. And you realize, I'm drinking that. <laughs> I'm drinking all that dirt and rock. It makes you wonder, <laughs> is this really healthy for me? You know, good old spring water is so much cleaner. People don't like the thought of it. And experts say, oh, that's not safe. It's not treated. It's not safe. People have lived for thousands of years on spring water. They ain't been drilling wells or purifying their water all that long. You know, how did they survive in Bible times? When all they had was what they got out of the ground. You know, how did they survive? Didn't hurt them. Nothing better than good old spring water. You know, nothing better. And nothing better than the water that proceeds out of the throne. You know, it said there in Revelations that He showed me a pure river of water of life. Clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And you know, another place in Revelations, he talked about that river. He said it started out small. And the farther it got, the wider it got. Until its expanse was massive. 
know it flows out into all of us. It's readily available there. Sure. But only if we're grounded in it. Only if we're rooted in Christ. Now you can have two plants side by side and one of them will live and one of them will die. Because the one's got its tap root in the water and the other mist. You know? The roots dive down and look for water. If they manage to find water in the ground, they'll survive. But if it's a dry season and their roots don't find a good source of water in the ground, they're at it. Mm -hmm. And they can miss it by that much and die. That's, mm -hmm. one, of the, that's one thing that really worried, worried me when we drilled our well. We could miss it by that much and spend mm -hmm. thousands of dollars and not get a drop. Yep. You know, you never know. And then some people will go 30 foot and hit an artesian well that shoots up out of it and 30 foot up in the air. And they can't even cap it because gallons and gallons are just bubbling up out of the ground from that on. You know, I don't think we found out that much. But it works. But we will never need for water. We will never thirst for that spiritual water as long as we're faithful to God. As long as we continue. But we've got to be careful with the devil that we don't allow the devil. The devil can't do it except we allow it. But we've got to be careful that the devil won't trick us into coming off of that route. Yep. You know, if we get so far away, God will remove us. If we sin, we're done out. We've done been cut off from the root. And then we're no better than these flyers in this vase. We could leave them here. It's come to eat. Here we'll throw them out tonight. Somebody take them home one. We can leave them here, but I guarantee you they'll be dead as a door now next Sunday. Dead as a door now. Every petal will be laying there. You'll have a big old brown mess <laughs> scattered all over. You know, but as long as we're grafted in God, we'll live this life, and when our time on this earth comes to end, we'll go on to be with the Lord. But we must remain faithful, grounded in the truth, rooted in that root, grafted to the root of David. Standing on the solid rock. You know, God told, or Jesus told Peter, He said, you are Cephas, mm -hmm. and upon you, which meant a rock. He said, upon you will I build my church. Did that mean that He was basically setting Peter to rule the church? No. That meant He was going to give Peter knowledge and teach to the people and they would learn. And we have Peter's knowledge. We have Christ's knowledge. We have John and Paul James and all these that have epistles here in this book. We have what God taught them. So they could teach to the ones that come after them. And that they could teach us their blessings, their mistakes. You know, God didn't put the stories where His people made mistakes in here to make fun of them. He put in there, ha ha, look how stupid they were. He put it in there to let us know not to do the same stupid stuff. That's right. But it blows my mind, man, does it over and over. The children of Israel made the same mistake over, over, about every generation. They'd make the same mistake. They'd turn to worship the idols. Now they'd worship the idols. God would destroy a bunch of them. They'd repent and worship God, and God would bless them. One, two generations down the road, they'd turn to worship the same idols. God would destroy them. The remnant would convert. God would bless them. Cycle after cycle, just like the leaves on the trees. Green, brown, gone. Green, brown, gone. It was the same with Israel. They never learned. And we haven't learned today. Because we still make the same mistakes. We still don't continue in His footsteps. We don't listen. You know, we tend to think we're facing problems that's never been faced. Church today, you know, people's never had, churches never had to deal with this before. They've never had to stand against homosexuality before. Lot stood against homosexuality. <laughs> you know? You know well, they didn't have to stand against the government trying to destroy their, their beliefs. Germans, Russia tried to had to stand against that. The locals had to deal with that. The children of Israel had to deal with that. You know, it's all happened before. 
It's the same cycle of violence over and over and over again. The same cycle of wickedness, the same old sins, the same old mistakes, over and over because as a people we never learn. We better stay grounded. We better stay rooted in Christ, growing that living water from Him, not from anybody else. That was one of the biggest, one of the big mistakes the children of Israel made was that they began to worship man. Mm -hmm. They lift man up too high. They lifted Moses up too high, time or two, or tried to. You know, they lifted Abraham up too high after his death. Because there, when Jesus was speaking, they said, we're the children of sons of Abraham. Pretty much said, we're guaranteed salvation. No. God never said that. You know, you can go on back. Cain was the son of Adam, but that didn't guarantee him a place in heaven. Cain sinned. Was cast out and cursed. We'll be the same way if we don't listen. Same old mistakes. Because people don't listen. And when the preacher warns them, they just get mad at the preacher. No, they like us when we're saying, telling stuff that's good. When, when, when we're preaching, Jesus loves you. They'll pat us on the back and, oh, that's such a good message. And they'll actually mean it. They'll look right in the eye and tell you then. Then you preach it. If they don't live right, they're going to go to hell. Or you preach they have to dress right or, or this or that. They won't talk to you. Or if they do say they like it, I like the message, brother. <laughs> They sound more like they want to wring your neck and that they really appreciate the message. And then they don't listen. And they get mad at us. And they go back biting the fat preachers. You know. Don't shoot the messenger. You know. If you don't like it, that's when you and God. But the Bible said if you see the sword come and you don't warn them, their blood's on your hand. But he said, if you see it come and you warn them and they don't listen, it's their own fault. Mm -hmm. Paraphrasing, that ain't word for word what he said. It's basically what he meant. You know, we deliver our souls and it will warn. You know, we must continue. Can't just warn one person and say, well, my job's done. You have to keep warning people. That's right. And a lot of times you have to keep warning the same people over and over and over and over and over again. Because they don't listen. But you've got to continue on. Remain in the faith. Sometimes it gets discouraging when numbers are down. And people don't seem to listen. You wonder, what are we going to do to get them to listen? You know, like with the camp meeting, you wonder, who are we going to get to preach? How is it going to go on? You know, it'll go on if God wants it to go on. God will provide the preachers. If, as we talked about, we need to get singers before another year for it, God will provide the singers. I don't know where we're from. He might have to have us haul in a bunch of rocks and let them sing the praises of God. The Bible said if people wouldn't praise Him, the rocks would. But, you know, I don't like rock and roll, but if the rocks want to praise Him, we'll bring them in here. We won't make them roll. We'll haul them so they have to. You know, God will provide. He always has. You know, as long as we remain faithful, a way will be made. As long as we remain rooted in the truth. And the truth is Jesus Christ. People don't want to believe that. They don't want to accept that. They will say, well, Jesus wasn't the Christ. Or, you know, well, I don't like what He preaches, so I'm going to write a different Bible. Whatever, they may not accept it. But there's only one truth. And that is that you have the only way to heaven is through through and by the name of Jesus Christ. And anybody that enters in any other ways as a thief and robber, you won't make it. You know, there's only one way. And that's the Bible. Sure. There's only one Bible, and that's the King James Version. Amen. The NIV and the... What all of them that I could, I could stand here all night if I can remember them listening. I think there's two or three hundred different versions now. They get steadily worse. But the King James is the oldest original version available to man today. 
All the others came from this one. Because they didn't like this, they removed it. This is the truth. Accept it. If you want to make it. But that's what we don't want to do. Remain the truth. The Bible said that the Word was made flesh. This is the Word of God. Well, if the Word was made flesh, that means Jesus Christ. Therefore, He is the Word, and this is Jesus Christ. That's right. Therefore, if we profane the Bible, misuse the Bible, change the Bible, we're changing Christ. And you can't do that. It must end through Christ. It must remain rooted and grounded in God. Faithful unto the end. You know, he said, the scripture went, so I guess it would admit say it. So. We have the knowledge. It's available. And we can't say in the judgment day, Lord, I didn't have a chance to know that. People are going to try. Or think they are. I don't think we're going to say a word. Whether we're righteous or lost, I don't think we'll say a word on the judgment. People think, well, I'm going to stroll up there and I'm going to defend myself. No, you won't. You'll fall flat on your face. And if He gives you leave to speak, you'll beg for mercy. But chances are you ain't going to be able to find your voice enough to talk. Nobody that ever faced God could. Nobody's seen the face of God. But many people have seen the semblance of God. And not a one of them could speak. Every one of them fell on their faces. The whole children of Israel, when they heard the voice of God, trembled cried and wailed and they begged Moses don't let him speak to us again. You speak to him but don't let him talk to us again. Scared him to death. You know. And that's the way it will be in the judgment day. We're not going to stand up there full of bravado and pride and stand for God and think we're going to lawyer our way out of trouble. We're going to stand there trembling and quaking as they read out the book of life and tell us everything we've ever done. And if it's not covered by the blood, we will suffer for eternity. If we haven't, remain faithful. See, anything we've done before we got forgiveness was covered in the blood. But it went back. It didn't go forward at that. You sin afterwards, you're going to have to get that covered in the blood too. Remain faithful. If you continue, we better get people to the meat of the word because the milk won't get through. A child can only live so long on milk, for it has to have solid food or it will die. A Christian cannot live only when Jesus loves me, but so long before they will and die, because if they don't know right from wrong, how can they serve God? Except you know me, you cannot serve me. The Bible said something to that effect. That's not word for word. So if we don't know His commandments, how can we keep them? Mm -hmm. you know, common sense tells us a lot. But we still have to know the Bible. Which means we have to study. We have to listen when God talks to us. And we have to remain faithful. Amen. Share the message. The Lord said it. Believe I've done what He'd have me to do. So we'll leave it there.